If you fly long enough, you start to notice that aviation history is full of hangar myths that everyone repeats as if they're POH numbers. One of the big ones goes like this. After the war, Britain did something unbelievably stupid. They sold their best jet engine to Stalin. He copied it, built the MiG-15, and a few years later, British and American crews were getting shot at over Korea by an aircraft powered by a British design. It's a great story. It's also way more complicated than the one-liner you hear on YouTube or in the comments. But how did Britain end up selling jet engines to the Soviets in 1946? Were they really that naive? To understand the decision, you have to forget the later Cold War picture we all carry in our heads and drop into 1946 Britain. The war is over, but the country is financially wrecked. Six years of total war have burned through reserves. The empire is fraying. John Maynard Keynes is warning ministers that they're staring at a financial Dunkirk. Not in the air, but on the balance sheet. Rationing is still in full force. In 1946, after a bad harvest, Britain even has to ration bread for the first time. That's how tight things are. Keeping 40-odd million people fed means buying in huge quantities of grain from abroad. One of the few places that can reliably ship that much wheat, the Soviet Union. On top of that, the politics aren't as simple as the West versus the Soviets yet. The Red Army has only just stopped fighting alongside the British and Americans. The United Nations is being set up. There are already plenty of mutual suspicions, but in London there's still this hope that maybe if everyone plays their cards right, a stable post-war arrangement can be worked out. A lot of people don't yet realize just how cold the Cold War is going to get. And then there's the awkward relationship with Washington. Britain desperately needs an American loan to stay solvent, and they do get one. Roughly three and three-quarter billion dollars, long-term, low interest. But it doesn't feel like a reward for standing firm in 1940. It feels like a hard-nosed commercial deal. Not long after, the U.S. passes the Atomic Energy Act and slams the door on nuclear cooperation, even though British scientists had been central to the Manhattan Project. From the British point of view, that looks like, thanks for your help, we'll now keep the real toys to ourselves. So if you're Clement Attlee, the new prime minister, here's your world. You're broke, your population is on rations, you need wheat from the Soviets, you've just discovered that your strongest ally is also perfectly happy to lock you out of key technology when it suits them. And you're trying to maintain some sort of working relationship with both of the emerging superpowers. Attlee is a socialist, yes, but he is not some secret fan of Moscow. This is the man who will sign off on Britain's own nuclear deterrent and give the green light for covert operations against the Eastern Bloc. People in his own security services describe him and his cabinet as having a long-standing hostility to communists. So the caricature of a bunch of dreamy pinkos gifting engines to their ideological cousins just doesn't match the record. Into that mess walks a proposal from Moscow. They'd like to buy some of Britain's new jet engines. And this is where the Neen itself matters. In the myth, the Neen is always described as Britain's most advanced engine, as if they ship their crown jewels east. In reality, the Neen is a very capable design, but it's already being treated as an export product. It's a big, powerful, centrifugal flow turbojet. The problem is that everyone in the industry can already see that the long-term future is axial flow engines like the later Avon. The Neen is excellent. But it's not magic, and it's not a black project locked in a bunker. Rolls-Royce is actively marketing it abroad. The Americans will build it under license as the Pratt & Whitney J-42. Canada and France are interested. The Royal Navy will use it in the Seahawk and Attacker, but the RAF's real hopes are pinned on newer designs. So from Whitehall's point of view, this isn't like posting the complete Vulcan drawings to Moscow. This is a solid, high-thrust engine that is already, in their minds, a commercial commodity. The Soviets also ask for complete meteors and vampires. Those airframe requests are quietly refused. The British don't want their entire jet fighter line stripped and copied. Engines, though, those look like things you can trade. Atlee weighs it all up. The desperate need for exports, the importance of not picking a fight with a key grain supplier, the fact that the Americans are already treating technology as a bargaining chip, and he signs off on selling Neens and Derwents to the USSR. In a memo, he essentially says he sees no good reason to withhold them, and that saying no will just create bad blood. Now about that famous Stalin line, 
What fools would sell us their secrets? You'll often hear it told as a gloating reaction after the deal, as if he's laughing at the British once the engines are in his hangars. The timeline is actually the other way around. The remark comes when his aviation advisor, Alexander Yakovlev, first suggests approaching the British to buy jet engines. Stalin's initial reaction is disbelief. He cannot imagine that the British would actually sell that kind of kit to him. Yakovlev has to explain that the engines are not some hidden treasure. They're being advertised internationally. So the quote doesn't prove British stupidity so much as it shows how odd their export policy looked from the Kremlin. Once the crates arrive, Soviet engineers do exactly what you'd expect. They pull the engines apart and start copying. The first result is the RD-45, essentially a Sovietized Neen. It is not a straightforward clone. The British have a lead in turbine materials, especially the mnemonic alloys in the hot section, and matching that is painful. Early Soviet copies suffer because their metallurgy just isn't there yet. But the thing about a centrally directed paranoid state that sees itself under threat is that when it decides high-performance jets are a priority, they become a priority. Problems get thrown resources. From the RD-45, Klimov's team moves on and develops the VK-1. Same basic architecture, but adapted from the ground up to Soviet materials and manufacturing. Slightly larger, more flow, more thrust. In the West, the VK-1 is often described as a Neen copy with more power. That sells the Soviet engineers short. The Neen gives them a huge jump start and a reference, but the VK-1 ends up being its own locally optimized engine. Then you bolt that engine into a small swept wing airframe backed by good German-derived aerodynamics, and you get the MiG-15. This is where the decision Attlee signed in a quiet London office suddenly shows up on gun camera footage. In Korea, the MiG-15 is a nasty surprise. Against B-29s, it is devastating. Against early jets and props, it is flat out superior. Only the F-86 can really stay with it in the envelope that matters. British meteors can't compete at high altitude. RAF pilots know it. NATO planners know it. And everyone in the business understands that inside many of those MiGs is an engine that owes its existence to the Neen. Later, a Rolls-Royce executive walks through a factory in China and sees VK-1 derivatives being built under license. He recognizes the layout instantly and is horrified. Rolls-Royce will try to claim compensation for unlicensed use of its designs. In the middle of the Cold War, that goes exactly nowhere. So were the British fools? From the vantage point of a cockpit over MiG Alley, with the benefit of hindsight, it's very tempting to say yes. They exported engines to a future opponent, underestimated Soviet engineering, and misjudged how fast an ally of convenience was going to turn into a strategic rival. But if you stand in 1946 instead, the picture is more nuanced. You're running a country that is nearly bankrupt. You need exports. You need grain. You've just been cut out of atomic cooperation by the Americans. The Soviets are difficult, but not yet a declared enemy. The engine in question is powerful, but not your ultimate trump card. You believe your real technological edge is in the axial machines coming next, not in the centrifugal unit you're openly selling to others. From that cockpit, Selling Neens to Moscow looks less like treason and more like a calculated, if risky, trade. Today's export hardware, in exchange for tomorrow's food and foreign currency, plus a bit of goodwill with a touchy but important neighbor. Where they really got it wrong was in their threat assessment. They assumed the Soviets would struggle for years to match British turbine materials. They assumed the Neen was far enough behind the real cutting edge that giving it away wouldn't fundamentally matter. They assumed you could treat Stalin's USSR like just another difficult customer. In the end, the Soviets managed to work around the material issues, fold the Neen's lessons into their own designs, and get a superb little fighter into service at a speed that shocked the West. The road to MiG-15 dominance ran through a deal signed in London. For us looking back, it's a reminder that decisions about hardware are never just about performance numbers. They're about context timing, and assumptions. Britain didn't hand over its best engine out of some urge to help communism. It sold what it thought was a marketable mid-term technology to solve immediate, ugly problems at home. Four years after the ink dried on the export paperwork, the real bill was paid at altitude in contrails and cannon fire halfway around the world.